Can you hear? Yeah, I can hear. Is, am I okay, or as far as you can tell? Yep, Peter's at work, and so it's just you and me. Oh, well, it's kind of funny. I'll be looking over at the monitor to see him, and he won't be there. <laughs> Recorded live at Tox and Tasting Studios, it's the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. Let's go. From the Tox and Tasting Studios, this is... It's Talks and Tastings, Vicar, because sometimes people have emailed us and said, Toxic Tastings? <laughs> well, that's <But> what I heard. <laughs> talks and Tastings, because there used to be, uh, well, I should get on with it first. From the Talks and Tastings Studios, this is a Clerical Airs podcast, a show that shows you... The show that shows you... What goes on behind the collar? All right. You're getting there. <laughs> I'll get it better next time, smoother. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, we're kind of recording this at an odd time. It's just you and me today. Uh, no Peter. So oh. if we ramble, uh, he'll have to fix it. Okay. So, you know, sometimes you could tell if he's not here, he gets mad and he'd throw some weird things in the editing. So we'll have to see how this turns out. Well, no one will know if we rambled because presumably he'll fix it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> or he'll just speed it up really quick or something like that. Right. So how are you doing, Vicar? Are, is your head swimming a little bit? My head is swimming just a bit. Uh, as you know, I'm working on a, a sermon for Sunday, September 4th. So so not this weekend, but the, but the one following. And uh, today we had time to sit down and look at my first draft. Uh, which you had me handwrite, which is different for me. I'm used to typing, but that's okay. I thought that was a good process, made me think about things in a different way. And so I had a what I thought was, you know, a, a decent draft. I'd looked at the text, uh, happens to be the text concerning the deaf man that was healed. And, and that that always happens, by the way, like uh, the first sermon, you know, yeah, ah, this is, I feel pretty good about this. Right, <laughs> right. And it's probably, you know, it was probably okay. Yeah, it wasn't, I suppose. wasn't bad. But, <laughs> but nevertheless, like... Uh, but my, my, uh, my, my, I'm not here to make sure your sermons are right. not bad or right. okay. Right. Maybe it was a sermon I could have got away with or, or something along those lines. But uh, but as it turned out, upon review, uh, with a, with a, upon review with a more skilled pastor, yourself... Um, there were many things that uh, that could be said better, and I um, I had I felt like I had written uh, an okay sermon, but it was a lot of just sort of explaining, and maybe uh, like I'd wrote a paper for the seminary or something like that, rather than a, a sermon for people. So and and so I rudely pulled you away from that to to get into the podcast studio. <laughs> That's right. So as I addressed uh, those shortcomings, I found that. Um, the, the the brainstorming that we did together was very helpful. And so we'd put together a more, uh, well, a better storyline, I suppose, on how to deal with that text. And what is, what's happened is that I've been able to write a sermon from that outline. It's not really an outline, I guess. We called it a bubbles or a... Right. A, right. From the bubbles. <laughs> 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 and I've barely referenced the original manuscript, and it's coming out a lot better. There's n- there's no doubt that this process has sharpened the, the sermon a lot. But I was in the midst of that rewrite, and it became time to, to come here and get on the podcast. Hey, I, have a, I have a meeting later this evening. So not here, somewhere else. This is circuit visitor stuff. Yeah. And so I kind of need to get... I would have let you, but I... I I need to get this podcast going, man. <laughs> yeah. It's about yeah, priorities. Yeah. Got to do it. You'll, I know you'll have the sermon done in time, but I wasn't sure about the podcast, so, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, but it, it, it is an interesting pod, uh, idea, and I have fun really helping the vicar kind of look at that. And a lot of times, like today, you kind of notice that uh, – um, a lot of times when you're you're kind of looking for a voice of the sermon, how often it is, we'll just take a closer look at the text, and that's kind of what we did, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it definitely was. Um, looking closer at the text, and, and I don't want to blow the punchline and tell people completely what it is, because, you know, maybe... Yeah, well, we'll have to talk about that next week. <laughs> yeah. But at any rate, looking uh, more careful at the text, uh, there, there, well, there was a really eye-opening situation that you characterized 
for me because I didn't see it at first. And then once, once you pointed it out, it was, oh, well, yeah, that kind of really is the core of what this story is about once you see it. And, uh, and that's why I think my second draft here is turning out fairly differently than my first draft because I had missed that point the first time around. And in, in, in a way that also, I think, connects with the listener better, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's, that's what I, I find one of the things that's brilliant about the Word of God is, you know, we always work on, oh, I want my sermon to relate to people. I want it to speak, sure. you know, <laughs> speak to the lives of the people or whatever. Oh, yeah. And, and usually the best way to get at that is to actually really understand the text and really understand what's going on. Right. Because uh, God doesn't change and human nature doesn't change. Right. And, um, and I think looking at some of the themes that uh, you can see and actually what's going on in the text is what brought you there. Yeah, no, most definitely. So instead of like retelling the text at kind of a surface level, I, I get to write a sermon about the key thing that was going on in the text, mm-hmm. uh, contrasting the first draft to the second draft. And well, one thing I talked about too is one thing is what makes the sermon different than what you're used to writing in a, a theological paper right. is in a theological paper you kind of have to prove everything, right? You yeah. know, when in a sermon situation, um, you can point things out to help them understand the text better, but it's not a situation where you always have to prove your point. Be ready to like after the sermon if someone why why did you come right. to that conclusion. And uh, but you know generally the, the people uh, trust that you've done the exegetical work to fully understand the text, right? And 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 so it gives you more freedom to actually say what the text is doing. I actually, did that in the last sermon where it was almost halfway through, and I haven't referenced a text, but I said I've been preaching this text the whole time, and then right. <laughs> yep, I remember you saying that. <laughs> oh, okay. If you say so, no. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it came through that I was, but... Right. But, um, but yeah, it's always fun for me to, to be a part of this this pr- process and watching the, the lights come on and with the vicar. Right. I mean, and I was intentionally trying to follow the advice you'd gave me before I even started the first draft about not writing it to sound like a paper at the seminary. I, I truly was attempting sure. that. But which, it, which is why I like to hand that first one to kind of break them the habit is the handwriting. It's, yeah, right, because we don't handwrite our papers at the seminary. Right. And uh, But nevertheless, like it's sort of been beat into me for a couple of years, and so it, it comes out a little bit sounding like a paper the first draft did. Yeah, I, I, I like the one reason why I kind of thought I'd try the, because sometimes I don't bring the bubble thing in right away. Okay. But I thought that maybe with your, your engineering background, that that kind of visual way of, of, of seeing how a sermon from a visual point of view could look with the bubbles and organizing and and seeing a structure as you would as an engineer. I thought that might be helpful. Does well, that make sense? it was helpful. And also, I mean, like as a civil engineer, like I'm so rectilinear. In other words, everything I see should somehow be at right angles to each other and, and stack up nicely like a set of blocks. And I think that can come across in my writing. It's a and so the bubble format blows away that type of thinking where everything's linear and, and stacked up like a like a set of bricks or something. Mm-hmm. And so now as I'm writing the second draft, I'm looking at the bubbles and saying, okay, which which one of these bubbles might be the, the best place to go for the way this story is unfolding rather than, well, clearly it goes here because that brick is stacked on the other one. <laughs> like, right, right. Because good, good, like good engineering is probably predictable. Yeah, Yes, right? yeah, it should be. And, and sometimes predictable in sermons becomes... Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah it gets, well, everybody predicts it, so it gets boring, yeah. or they don't have to listen because they know what you're going to say next. <laughs> so uh, um, this Sunday, uh, we should probably talk about... Oh, what, what do we got to drink there first before we get into oh, that? Oh, uh, something new for me, Spindrift. Splendrift, yes. Water. What, I, what I like about the Splendrift, and, and the listener knows this, is uh, it actually most most sparkling waters flavored? It, it doesn't really taste like what it's supposed to, like the fruit, yeah. you know. Right. This actually tastes like they put lime in it. Well, that sounds promising because I've had sparkling water and uh, and read like accurate critiques of it, 
where it almost seemed like you're just drinking sparkling water with no flavor whatsoever, but maybe way off in another room, somebody's yelling strawberry or something. Right. But it's not really in the right. drink. And, and the, the listener also knows that the, the lime, the Splendor Lime is good with just a little bit of tequila. Oh, okay. But we're not doing that today. Uh, maybe next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's uh, take a crack. And mm-hmm. I, I've got uh, the Arnold, Arnold Palmer Light. That's one of my go-tos, too. Okay, good. So, 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 so what do you think? Tell me if you can tell the okay. difference between that and most sparkling waters. I can tell the difference, but I don't know if it screams lime to me. I'll have to take another couple swallows, okay. I suppose. It almost seemed like asparagus or something. See, I thought you would be well familiar with the lime, because isn't that what they, they give to people in, in Fairbanks so that they don't get scurvy? <laughs> Well, they should. <laughs> and there is no sunlight. It's tasty. Okay. But I think if I hadn't been told lime, I might have wondered what the flavor was. But it does. Really? Yeah. It's for, maybe it's, you know, maybe my taste buds are broken. <laughs> so this Sunday, um, uh, I'm actually in, in a little bit, I have a top 12 list about the Old Testament reading. But but uh, let's talk about the gospel reading first, okay. as a as a what I'm preaching on, and then uh, and then from there we'll go into the uh, uh, the, the uh, Old Testament top twelve list. So okay, so read the the gospel reading there. Oh, once again, the vicar has been authorized to read the gospel. <laughs> okay, for the podcast, for the podcast, right? <laughs> and this is the Holy Gospel according to Luke, chapter eighteen. Verses 9 through 14. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. All right. So uh, um, have you studied this text at all at length? Not at length, but I've, of course I'm familiar with the story. Sure, sure. So I think one, one thing that uh, I'm, I'm mindful of in preaching this is is uh, a lot of times people will hear this text and think, oh, this is a parable about about not being like the Pharisee. Right. That's the bad guy. Yeah. And, and it is true. He's kind of the, the bad guy. Right. Certainly. But it's not necessarily uh, the prayer. It's the faith. Mm-hmm. The unbelief. The unbelief. And, and the fact that, well, Jesus said, told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, okay? And that's that gives you a, a clue of, of how to understand this. It's one where he preached to those who trusted in themselves that they are righteous, and as a result of that, contreated others with contempt. And we'll talk about this when we talk about Cain and Abel, uh, because the first thing is a faith issue, hmm. righteousness in themselves. And and for them, it could be a whole host of things. It could be, um, obviously, works righteousness, that they had, you know, uh, as we hear sometimes, oh, these Ten Commandments I have kept. Right. Or it could be a birthright issue. Mm-hmm. We we have Abraham as our father, right? Um, but either way, it's it is uh, 
an elevation that God sees their estate, their works, who they're born to, all the things that would that we would find impressive in someone else, uh, you know, that God is equally as oppressed in them as, as they are. Right. Yeah. Or you hear people saying like, well, they were basically a good person. And so sometimes they even assign that righteousness in themselves to another person. Oh, that other person, they, they were pretty good. Right. And so when you do that, um, and you find righteousness and look to yourselves, what's the measuring stick? Well, for this man, it was, I'm not like that yeah. tax collector. The, and the extortioners and the adulterers, but and the tax collector. Right, right, when he actually was. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just it, like them. Yeah, he was just as sinful as the others. And so he says, I fast twice a week, I give tithes to all that I have, that I get, um, and and so he's standing on all the things that are that are, are good things, right? Right. Those are definitely good things to avoid and good things to do. But the the fast is misguided. Mm-hmm. We're not saying it's not. We're not saying that fasting is bad. Certainly, fasting uh, not not so that uh, you know you get the health benefits of it. But <laughs> fasting to isn't a bad thing if it helps you remember that your your life depends upon God and his goodness. Hmm. Um, but uh, but he's that's what he's standing on. I get credit for that. Mm-hmm. That's what makes me better than these people in the sight of God. This is why I deserve the kingdom, right. because I fast twice a week and I tithe. You know? you, you'll notice... Uh, uh, as you you uh, continue on in your your work as a pastor and and or as in, a, in your continual training for it that that uh, you could every pastor will gasp when they hear this. Well, I was born in that church, I was confirmed in that church, mm-hmm. and that should supersede from that point on everything <laughs> that follows, almost as if to say. Well, certainly, I shouldn't ever receive the judgment of God. After all, you know, mm-hmm. I and what I say should really count because I was born in that church and right. I was ba- uh, confirmed in that church. And uh, although I, you know, I go to a Methodist church now, or you know, I've been Baptist for thirty years, <laughs> right. or all this should still carry weight, you know? Yeah, as though God is impressed with with that. Mm-hmm. And I have heard someone. And maybe they didn't mean it in a bad way at all, but they were telling me that their parent had been a founding member of the congregation. But it seemed as if they might have thought it gave them a little extra weight in matters around the church. Yeah, well, I think I think there is something to the... There is a blessing in, in having uh, people uh, um, have a, a, a generational uh, adherence to the church if it keeps them in the word it right. keeps them but but here in the text it's all about well i'm so glad that and in its faith and uh it's works righteousness and if that's your measuring guide if that's your measuring stick uh, is is your own righteousness then the, the, it's really easy to then simply compare it yourself to the tax collectors. I am saved because I'm not like that guy. Right. Right. And you see that, like, he must have figured that fasting twice a week was the measuring stick. But what if there was another guy that was fasting three times a week? He wasn't comparing himself to somebody who did more, but he was kind of declaring himself to be the yardstick. Well, especially considering he is, sp- speaks to a lot of Christ speaks to a lot of people who who were using their measuring stick up against Jesus himself, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, this is a guy who eats with sinners. Oh yeah, and you know, this is a guy who associates with prostitutes and tax collectors, and allows his disciples to pick grain on the Sabbath. Right. <laughs> so. So they, even Jesus doesn't fit their measuring stick, which says something. Right. So then you get to the 
the the the tax collector who who shows faith and repentance. He doesn't he doesn't use all the things that we would be impressed with as a measuring stick. He simply trusts in the mercy of God. That's his only hope, is if God is right. merciful to him. And uh, so not even if feeling as though he is able to lift his up eyes up to heaven, beating his breast, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Now as we look at that, um, the reason why I say it's important to remember the, the faith and repentance side is is uh this I didn't think this is a Midwest thing. I don't know if you've hmm. picked up on this. Okay, let's see. Okay. And that is, well, um, yes, I don't want to appear to be filled with pride. I don't want to be like that Pharisee. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to do things like make sure I don't sit in the front of church. <laughs> I'm going to make sure I express the same kind of piety. Oh, no, no. You know, you take the speed. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'm not saying it's all, it's a bad necessarily, but there can be, in the, especially in the Midwest, I think a false piety where, hmm. where, where you want to prove just how humble you are. Mm-hmm. So you're not like, you don't want to be like the Pharisee without actually looking at the faith issue. Hmm. So they appear to be deferring to others, but maybe inside they're very proud of the fact that they're deferring to others Correct. in such a humble way. Correct. <laughs> Which is why you have to talk about, um, because, you know, everyone will look at that and say that's pra- prayer is ridiculous. You know, I would never say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um. And so, uh, in in this context, then I would say that's why you really well because it's textual, but also if you want to get to the heart of the matter in preaching this, is it has to become a faith issue. It has to become a repentance issue. It has to bring them to hear God's law in such a way that they can make the same confession that the tax collector makes, uh, because he is the one that went home justified. He is the one that is crushed by the law and raised up. And uh, and the, the, the Pharisee, he just is cons- uh, worried about being raised up. Right. Well, well he already is raised up, apparently, <laughs> but, which is his primary concern is that he's already attained it. Right. Right. So, so that I think, and the, the, the last thing I wanted to mention this is is uh, how how Jesus fits into this too, because because obviously the forgiveness is given through him, right? Right. But when you look at it, how he ends it, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. When you look at Christ, even in his earthly life, he had every reason to say everything that that Pharisee would said. Uh, except it would be true. Right. Uh, I have not sinned. Right. I am worthy of everything. I am God's son. Uh, I, I am sinless. I am a blemish-free lamb. Right. Every reason to actually reflect uh, what mm. this Pharisee says out loud. But but what does Jesus himself do? He takes the lowest seat. He humbles himself way beyond any of us ever could. He who had no sin became sin for us. Mm-hmm. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death upon a cross. So God raised him up, Philippians is all Philippians 2, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. Right? Emptied himself and taken on the form of a servant. So this, this also then certainly says something about Jesus, who not only uh, talks about the faith of this tax collector— but then becomes the tax collector. Hmm. Not only he, he, because the only way that tax collector can go home justified is through the blood of Jesus right? and through his forgiveness. It's not just that 
I mean, there's a process. God is just, and, and that sin needed to be paid for. And it was paid for by God offering up his own son as a lamb in, in our place and our stead. So just even as we say it's faith, it is repentance, God, in faith we are saved, at the same time, even as Jesus is saying that, he himself, when he came to this earth, born of the Virgin Mary, humbled himself to the, the greatest degree in our place. So he became even, he became a tax collector, he became the murderer, he became the rapist, he became, he became Cain from our Old Testament. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so he, he, not, he not only just te- tells us, he explains himself in a way in doing this, uh, of he himself humbling himself. And, and so mm-hmm. if Christ so humbles himself, who of us could then claim any kind of righteousness on our own? If this is how Christ came to this world, is this if this is how he emptied himself, certainly none of us could ever have a word that we can say, Oh, I am I am deserving of the kingdom of heaven because of whatever thing we say outside of the righteousness of Christ, it simply will not do. Um and so that kind of ties all those things together. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, that was a lot and and I can only really echo what you've just said, that Jesus became sin for us. It was interesting to hear you say it the way that you just did, because I had never applied the titles to Christ, like, oh, he became a murderer, or he became a rapist. Uh, but in the sense that he became sin, this is a, a very vivid way to portray what it means to become sin. He substituted, he became the sacrifice and substitute for all the people that we would apply those labels to. And he right. took that to the cross and defeated right. it. Right, and by saying that, I'm not saying, obviously, the sins of commission. Right, I'm obviously. Saying, right, I'm saying that uh, um, he took all of that upon himself. He right. stepped into the, our, our dirty waters of baptism. Yes. Um, he... he uh, uh, he was the last one in the bathtub, so to speak, that took all our sin and dirt yeah, and came out dirtier. <laughs> right. And it's also interesting that it wasn't because the man, the tax collector, prayed correctly, and then therefore because he prayed correctly, the, then he's, because of that, he is made righteous. It's because of the object of his faith. It's because of his belief in the promises in Jesus that he was justified because we can't just look at his words and say, okay, now we've got a formula. And if we pray like this tax collector, then we ourselves right. will have done something so good. Right. We will have earned our righteousness. Ah, uh, see, see, I see, I see you're, you're speaking to your, your background. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> probably right? so. Well, when do you New Year's? Oh, when I, I will lock myself in my closet and I accepted Jesus as my savior is when. <laughs> right. Just do the formula. Yeah. Just. The, right. Yeah. You just say that prayer. The sinner's prayer, and uh, I think that's you know somewhere between the testaments or something. I don't know. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? Where it, where it became a formula, right? You yeah. know, and 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 then also that being said too, that also reflects how we understand the sacraments. It's not just some sort of uh, just do this. It is baptism is is uh, the promise of God being held to. It is uh, being baptized. You're baptized into Christ. And it's not like, oh, it's a formula, but it's it's something where you are buried with Christ and raised with him, and to this day you are buried with him and raised with him. And, mm. and it affects the heart. And when people say, well, how come you Lutherans say baptism saves you? You're going to just teach people, as long as I, I went through that mm-hmm. process, I'm saved. But that's not what we're saying about baptism. No. We're, we're saying baptism is, in a sense, what this tax collector is doing. I am washed clean by Jesus, and uh, I am unworthy. And, you know, as we begin each divine service in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you're saying... I am still that tax collector washed clean by the blood of Jesus. Hmm. I am that sinner who who needs. So it's not just like a oh yeah, I went up in my room and I said this prayer and now I'm I'm saved. 
right? Like it's a mental state or a psychological way of being, and, and now that means you're saved. Right. Um, but and baptism is is a continual lifelong flowing of salvation for you. Mm. And much in the same as the Lord's Supper. Uh, this is why uh, when we talk about receiving the Lord's Supper, you receive it like the tax collector. Uh, this is why uh, you go, before you go to the Lord's Supper, you, you uh, go to your brother who you have fault with and make mm-hmm. amends. And this is why uh, you come as a beggar, uh, because in the Lord's Supper, we're not saying, I am worthy to receive all these things. Right. You're saying, I, I need what Jesus has. Right. And what he gives me. I might say, I have been made worthy to receive these things, but only on account of Christ, and certainly nothing that I did that could have made me worthy to receive the body and blood. Right. So so people outside of the Lutheran Church will say, well, you, you Lutherans confuse me. You think there's so much behind this baptism, like all mm-hmm. you have to do is go to the Lord's Supper. Not realizing the fact that, well, there's preparation before receiving it. Right. There's repentance. There, we walk through the entire service is geared toward uh, making us our hearts ready to receive that Lord's Supper, confessing our sins, receiving absolution, hearing the Word of God, leading us to repent and find hope and mercy uh, in Christ, uh, uh, singing to God, Lord, have mercy right. in the Kyrie, all those things, even the, the Lord's Prayer leading up to that, as, as some would view as a sacramental prayer of um so so all those things lead up to that so right and then we receive the gifts that god has prepared for us not as some good act that we're doing but as beggars receiving a precious gift from god very good so we should probably get to our um our top 12 list which is on the old testament reading okay so first before we do that uh what do you think should happen vicar yeah, I'm not going to get it right because I just, uh, <laughs> I I knew you were going to ask me at some point and I was racking my brain trying to remember what the right response was. <laughs> Peter, play the play intro. Play the intro. <laughs> Enough nonsense. It's time for Bullhagen's Top 12. All right, so this Top 12 list is, I, I did uh, a little bit of reading of some of Luther's comments on this too, uh, but uh, just Top 12 things. That we can, that we learn from uh, the account of Cain and Abel. And this is our Old Testament reading. So can you read that for us, please? I certainly can. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, 
Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. All right, so as we get into this, why do you suppose this was uh, chosen for for this gospel reading? That is a great question. I know the gospel reading has the contrast between the Pharisee and the tax collector, and then the twist of the story of which one was actually righteous. Um, so I'd have to think about how that connects. Okay. You got a contrast going on again. You do have a contrast. In fact, I would say you have a contrast of in much the same way, hmm. and that is uh, what is Cain relying on in his sacrifice? What is Abel relying on in his sacrifice? Mm-hmm. So uh, we'll get into that. So that brings us, we'll start off with number 12. Number 12. God had a merciful, merciful way of dealing with humanity after the fall. And there was a visible sign of his grace, meaning uh, the sacrifice. The sacrificial system, I think, was one of grace. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and not one of outer works. So using the example of, of the Pharisee and the tax collector. When the Pharisee, if he were making the sacrifice, what would he have said? He would say, look at this wonderful sacrifice right. I am making. And he'd probably would say, thank you that as the firstborn son, I'm not like this, my brother Abel. <laughs> right. He's the one who gets to, to, to chase these animals all over the place. I get to work, you know, mm-hmm. hand in the dirt kind of a guy. You know? Right. The firstborn, you know, and Luther would say, um, he said that uh, part of the problem with Cain was with, with uh, Eve uh, giving birth to Cain. What does she say? Behold, I have uh, received a man the, with the help of the Lord. The man, yeah. Right. I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Right. The seed, Luther would say, that she... Mm-hmm. According to Christ's promise, she believed that Cain was going to be right. the seed, the special offering who deserved everything. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. So, so uh, um, I think the first point is, though, that this sacrificial system was a way of God dealing merciful by accepting Abel's sacrifice. It is a relationship of grace and mercy. A mercy that Abel would have relied on, and a, and a sacrificial that are probably taught by their father Adam. Right. So, so God, and this brings us to mm. I'll get you number ten, but I want you to think about that for a minute. Okay. That that in a way, this sacrificial system was also a way of showing Cain and Abel where they stood before God. That's what we have in the church. Hmm. You know, God wants to let us know exactly where he stands. So we have things like the Lord's Supper. We have baptism. We have the office of the keys. Right. And, and the office of the keys has two sides of it as well. Right? Confession and absolution? No, I mean uh, this way, mean? Uh, to, to loose and bind. Oh, got it. Right? So, so even as we, we let people know exactly where they stand... There's, it's in, in a yay or nay type of a situation. I see. Yep. And here, that's what God was doing, uh, letting Cain and Abel know exactly where they stand through the, the sacrifice. Right. And uh, and so, with that in mind, uh, we don't wouldn't may take it to mean that in some way, Cain the sacrifice itself was insufficient. Hmm. Right? Right. I mean, it must have been Cain himself who was, in one way or another, lacking the proper faith. He didn't, he didn't believe. Right. And so I don't mean to steal my, my numbers Ooh, as I get sorry. ahead, but Oops. that's fine. <laughs> uh, well, I should keep moving then. Number 11. Number 11. The sacrifice also was a reminder that their life was given and renewed by God. Hmm. Not just their 
spiritual life, but life in general. When, when you are giving these offerings, uh, you are doing so as a reminder that he's the one that gave it to me. I'm just giving back to God what he has already given to me. He's, he is the one who causes uh, the animal to grow, the seed to sprout, and uh, I trust so much in your goodness to me that you get the best. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and also understanding that along with that, I receive everything then by grace. Okay? Right. Number 10. Cain misunderstood the sacrifice, uh, what the sacrifices meant by his own anger. The fact that his sacrifice wasn't accepted and his anger behind it did not cause him to look at himself in his own sin. Hmm. It made him angry. The problem in his mind wasn't himself, his own sin, his own need for mercy. It was what it was wrong with my right. outward act of sacrifice, right? right? In much the same way, the Pharisee would be disappointed. What do you mean? You don't accept my fasting twice right. a week? You don't accept my tithing that I give to you? It's the yardstick problem again. It's the yardstick problem again. That's right. And uh, um, and so in many ways, it reflects Cain's thought here and his anger reflects the same kind of thing, hmm. uh, thinking that the outward sign is what was important. Right. He thought he had done good enough, and so instead of correcting his ways, he was angry because didn't he already do good enough? Right. By his own yardstick, he did. And, and then, the, but on the other hand, why was Abel's well, Abel, in a sense, like the tax collector, his sacrifice was accepted. He went home set, forgiven. Mm-hmm. Um, and and what made his sacrifice acceptable was not the lamb itself, the animal offered. Mm-hmm. It was the faith behind it. Right. Number nine. From the very beginning. Uh, uh, faith, true faith, is met with violence. Hmm. And so here you have uh, Abel in faith offering his sacrifice, and you have Abel who who is looking at his own righteousness, their own works, his own birthright as the firstborn. Cain. Cain, did I miss? Yeah, okay. it's okay. Yeah, Cain. Uh, what his response to that is is anger. And now I like how how does how does Moses word this here for us? He says uh, his face was oh his face fell. Yeah, right. So like his whole whole thing mm-hmm. fell when his sacrifice was not accepted. Now as you look at that, is it interesting? Here, how in this sacrifice, sacrificial system, God actually let Cain do exactly where he stood. Right. He did know that his offering was not accepted. He could fool, he could fool Adam and Eve. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, that's his parents, right? I mean, so. Yeah, right. He could... You never fooled your parents, I know, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, even if I thought I did, I probably didn't really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they they probably heard the music you were listening to and had their concerns. <laughs> <laughs> There's some truth to that. <laughs> All right, but but uh, but here we see how from the very beginning, how faith in Christ, or faith in true faith, is is met with violence from those who don't have it. Hmm. That is pretty interesting. I mean, we maybe thought of that as a, a more modern day problem, right? Oh, the holy wars and the crusades and things like that. And here we find it in yeah. chapter four. The very first death recorded. Right. Was uh, era, somebody who rose up against someone else who had true faith. Yeah. Persecution of the faithful already. Already. Hmm. Yep. Um. 
Uh, and so we shouldn't be ex- expect be surprised when that happens to us. And and you notice too how not only does does uh, persecution come to those who have faith, it comes from those who also have a very high opinion of themselves. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I'm doing it better than you, so um, so now I'm angry. <laughs> right. I'm going to show you who's better. <laughs> right, because, well, Abel was thinking of how his sacrifice was, ref- how God's mercy was reflected in him accepting the sacrifice on all those things. Cain's measuring stick. Right. Right? Yeah. That led him to to hate his brother for that. Hmm. And so there's another tie with the text, right? Yep. Number eight. It's hard not to think of Christ when thinking of Abel. The reason why I say that is um, uh, we just said how, talked about how Abel uh, was, was killed by his jealous brother, right? Yeah. That's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it, like we said earlier, it's the first recorded death of a human. We have the death of animals when, when uh, God made animal skins for them to, to wear. Right. But uh, here, Abel is the first human physical death that, that we find in Scripture. And then we have the fact that Christ is the the... In the same way, he is the first to, to rise and defeat that death. Hmm. How so, how Christ received Abel's death, um, in much the same way, and then how he overwhelms that with his resurrection, showing himself to be the true seed of the woman that Cain wasn't. Right, and it's a little bit like bookends when you put it like that. You've got the first human death, and then the first resurrection into eternal life. Right, uh, Paul would call it the first fruits. Yeah. Right. I think firstborn from the dead might also be a way it's played. right. Right. So, so I, I to me it's hard to to think of that of how how Abel and his per, his sacrifice, which was accepted. Christ, who was the sacrifice for our sake, that was accepted. Accepted, um, and how in Christ's sacrifice we find ourselves in God's grace and mercy. How Abel's sacrifice in faith pointed to the the final sacrifice for our sins that Jesus made. So all it's really hard for me to not think of Christ hmm. when you think of Abel. Did you think of it that way before? No, not quite like that before, but it fits. It fits. Number seven. Um, one is, uh, this is just a, kind of a Luther quote that I read that really it was in the section that I was reading earlier this week on, on it, uh, and I just like the quote, so I wrote it down. Okay. It has not, not as much to do with what we're talking about, but, but it, it was in that section where he's talking about Adam and Eve. Okay, and being the first parents, and how Cain and Abel were were children of obviously Adam and Eve, and he says this: We see, however, that God has taken care that man so great should not be born of man, but also as Christ, he himself should be born the seed of a woman. In a way, saying that. Uh, you know, well, well, when people think of uh, modern day, of uh, when we talk about the order of creation, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, and how those outside of the church think it in such a way of su- superiority one or over the other, right? And and yet, yet it's it's more of a calling here. You know, Eve, the mother. The seed is born from her, just like Mary is the mother of our of our Lord Jesus. Right. And how uh, is is man is not doing this on his own. He cannot do it without 
the woman. Right. No, absolutely. Uh, and it's so interesting in that text that it describes her, uh, describes Eve as being the one that will bear the seed when the, a lot of the Old Testament language, as I understand it, doesn't ever refer to that again as it as the seed was something that was spoken of men and, and their role in, in procreation. Mm-hmm. Yet in that text, it specifically says it would be her seed. Right. Number six. So when we look at this, there, there's a line in, in, in the reading, and you can maybe look at it up, where it talks about God accepting Abel's sacrifice. How exactly did he word that? And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So as you look at that, what we learn is, and this call harkens back to the gospel reading, it wasn't so much the sacrifice, but first he regarded the man mm-hmm. and then the sacrifice. Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It names the person and then and his offering. So just in case the listener wasn't sure, well, well, was it the sacrifice or was it faith? Right. Right? Right. It, he was, it was the faith by which he offered the sacrifice that was accepted. So it wasn't the sacrifice, it was the faith. Mm-hmm. Okay? Uh, and uh, in, the, in the seminary, you learn that we kind of refer to this as the Ordo salutis. Ah, must be a fourth year thing. Or I slept. The order of <laughs> salvation, God. where you realize that salvation, you know, we talk about uh, it is faith which creates the fruit. It is a faith that saves. It's not the fruit that saves. Right. It's not the works leading up to faith. There is an order to it. And there is, mm-hmm. and that, and so, so um, faith uh, is what brings salvation and the works follow. It's not the other way around. Right. And that's exactly what you have here. Abel's faith saves, not the sacrifice. Just like we talked about uh, um, the gospel reading, the Pharisee and the tax collector. It wasn't the prayer. It was right. the faith uh, underneath mm-hmm. where the Pharisee's God was himself, his works. The tax collectors was relying on the mercy of God. And I might add that faith itself is not a work that we can boast about. Right, it's a gift. It's a gift. Number five. God saw through Cain's outward false faith uh, and essentially excommunicated him. Hmm. Uh, That's the words Luther used too. Okay. Because if you think about it, uh, what is excommunication? It is letting a sinner, in order to lead them yeah, back, back to, to self, faith, back letting to faith. them know exactly where they stand. And that's what exactly the sacrificial system that they were doing did. His sacrifice was not accepted. And, and, and not only did God not accept it, do you see what he did in love? He explains why. Okay. Uh you know, he, he he let him know exactly where he stood, and he says, sin is crouching at your door. You know, the controlling nature of sin, it's hiding in, in the mm-hmm. reeds, so to speak. And, uh, and uh, he is explaining the power of sin uh, and impenitence that right. is laying hold of Cain. And... Uh, and God lets him know this. I think there is love in that. Right. It doesn't send him away in ignorance. Right. Tells he, he, him. he does what uh, Adam and Eve weren't able to do at that time. <laughs> right. He wasn't listening to them anymore. <laughs> so, so uh, in a sense, he, he, it was uh, the right of excommunication there. Hmm. Um, in God letting him know where exactly he stood and even explaining to it to him, uh, of what sin is desiring to do f- for him, and how it is seeks to control him, and how it seemingly is. Hmm. Um, and so 
he, and I think that's a gracious thing that he doesn't just leave it to him. He he goes through. This is why, and and um, and and he just doesn't say, "Oh, you gave me a bad sacrifice." Right. Yeah, that vegetable wasn't really first best. Right. It was only second best. And, and so, just like Cain or Abel's, excuse me, uh, faith, uh, sacrifice was accepted in faith. He then goes to show what was it by which Cain's sacrifice was not accepted? Was it because what exactly he gave was wrong? Hmm. Or was it his faith behind it, the sin that was crouching at the door? Right. And he was instructed that he must rule over it, that sin that crouches at the door. Right. And by the way, you'll see that, um, um, you see that, and we'll make this number three so I can <laughs> keep my numbers. Okay. Number three. Uh, you notice uh, towards the end of the, the reading that, that Cain actually understood this. Yeah, how does he word it? He talks about uh, how he is separated from God. You're talking about when he says, my punishment is greater than I can Yeah. Hurt? Right. Behold, you have driven me away today, which is the excommunication, from the ground and from your face, I shall be hidden. So he, he understands this. I'm like hidden from God. This is hmm. This is too much. Yeah. He's outside of grace. Right. And uh, um, it it leads him in that too, which is interesting. It leads him to be more upset about the punishment. Right. This is too much punishment. Right. Which shows he still there's a part he doesn't understand, and 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 uh, he's not concerned about um, you know, being changed. <laughs> he's concerned about well, this punishment is too much for me. Right, and then maybe somebody's going to kill him. Right, right. <laughs> so, so he's, you know, he's too worried about the earthly consequences of what this means, and it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't bring him to, um, I repent. Right, right. That instead of desiring to be back in God's favor through repentance, he kind of doubles down on it all and just tells God, no, your punishment's wrong, your yardstick is wrong, and I'm going to, I'm probably going to be killed because, you know, that's the way I am, so I guess other people are like that too, killing, right. killing me because I have a different belief than they do. Right. Mm-hmm. So that brings us to number two. Number two. We get a, an idea of what faithlessness looks like, and there's a point here for the church. Uh, when when God asks Cain where his brother is, he says, "Am I my brother's keeper?" keeper? Right, right. So, so when we think of of uh, of of faith and how it teaches us to love, when we are asked, "Am I my brother's keeper?" What is the proper response? The answer is yes. Yes, right. <laughs> And uh, um, and uh, his understanding of works righteousness didn't really allow him to see that. Right. If if God accepts me because my my sacrifice is good because of my outward looks are good, and if I'm doing the sacrificial system for my own benefit, I'm missing mm. the boat. Right. You know, if you are your feel as though you're you're your brother's keeper, um, for the sake of your own, what you get out of it, you're not actually showing love to your neighbor. You're showing love of yourself, right? And and when we receive the Lord's Supper, um, it's hard to to receive the Lord's Supper where Jesus welcomes you as a brother, and then to say, "Well, am I my brother's keeper after <laughs> right. after that?" Yeah, I wonder if, did Luther tie into this at all about monasticism, where they kind of invented good works that were always kind of like seen as yeah. doing something good directly for you, God rather than helping the neighbor? Yeah, he would see, he saw like 
he loved this because he saw the whole uh, the whole church hierarchy that he was arguing with mm. fitting into this whole system. The whole thing was Cain. They're all Cain. <laughs> okay. They're all concerned about not faith, but their outward sacrifices. Uh, yeah. They all think that they are the um, the uh, the natural firstborn mm. birthright people and uh, they're concerned with uh, their own sacrifices and and he gets a little bit of that uh, too of of uh, you serve God by serving your neighbor mm-hmm. and 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 that aspect but you know he he hits all all those all the he plays all the hits in this section okay yeah it seemed yeah. like he might yeah um, uh, and so so that shows too um what does faithlessness do what does it look like well look how it views your brother i'm not my brother's mm-hmm. keeper and number one uh the the blood crying out hmm. aspect um how how god shows love and concern for abel and even his blood that cries out hmm. And it, to me, that that shows one um, uh, the we think of the ongoing life of Abel. His blood is spilt; even his blood cries out. But yet he is is with God, with Christ. And uh, uh, I actually am reminded of uh, um, the the old Lenten hymn. That refers to this. Hmm. Um, Glory be to Jesus. Abel's blood for vengeance for uh, pleaded to the skies, but the blood of Jesus for our pardon cries. Hmm. That's good. Um, the, the crying out of the blood. Remember I said earlier, it's hard to think of Abel without thinking of Christ. Right. And how Abel's blood was spilt out of anger um, a victim of that anger, so Christ is, but his blood um, pr- cries out for our pardon, for our peace. It, Abel's blood cry out judgment in a sense. Okay, for right. pain. Christ's blood cries out for our pardon. So, anything I'm missing, Vicar? Ooh. Well, you didn't get into the fascinating mark of Cain. Which, sure. Which uh, is a interesting topic in itself. Uh, but no, I, don't, I wouldn't say you're missing anything. I think if you got 12 sermon ideas for an, an Old Testament reading, I think you're doing all right. Yeah, I, I guess I could have talked more of that, but by the time I, got, I was getting to that part of the text, I already had 12. Right. I mean, why keep going? <laughs> 12 is enough. Well, top 12, 13 list. You know? <laughs> have you done that yet? A 13, top 12? Or... Yeah, I've done I've done uh, honorable mention that, oh. didn't, that were not quite the top 12, but <laughs> they deserve some recognition. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Would you tie that one to baptism at all, if you were to preach on the Mark of Cain? Um. Like the ironic, I suppose, Mark versus our Mark. I don't know. Okay. I don't either. I just thought I'd ask because, I mean, we bear the name of Christ because of our baptism. And so in a way, we receive a Mark uh, through baptism that's maybe the opposite of Cain's um, in some ways. Well, all right. Right. Well, I'm I'm, I'm out of gas. I got to grab some dinner and be back on the road in about... A half hour or so. Okay. So uh, we should end it here. Should I tell people how they can get a hold of us? Yes. All right. Let's see how good your memory is. Where where can they get a hold of us? <laughs> well, they can contact us by email, writing to feedback at clericalerrors.org. And on facebook.com, they can find us looking for Clerical Errors Podcast. And on Twitter, we sometimes post as at Clerical Errors P, and the P stands for podcast. And uh, before I forget, we did get an email from someone who had uh, was uh, kind of upset enough with what you had said oh, yeah. to mention, and that is is uh, we had an emailer who mentioned 
Remind the good vicar, he says, that grunge is from Washington State, not the Pacific Northwest generally. That's our folk music to this day. Ah. Well, I mean, I have to concede the point, even though it rubs me the wrong way a little, because obviously Washington is in the Pacific Northwest, but he's being, uh, as an engineer would say, he's being precise, whereas I was accurate. Is that, is that a th- is that a th- is there like a rivalry between Oregon and Washington? Is that is that what I see going on right here? Uh, well, there there might be. You know, I guess the I think both of us feel like more of a rivalry towards California, but you know, once you once you eliminate California from the picture, then yeah, probably Washington, Oregon. You know, who can be more liberal might be one of the contests. <laughs> All right. Well, well, that's a a good time to end. Thank you for listening. I'm Bullhagen. I'm Vicar. And may your Vicar be able. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Thank you for joining us. This podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Questions, thoughts, concerns? You can contact us on Facebook at facebook.com slash clerical heirs podcast. On Twitter, at Clerical Heirs P for podcast, or email us at feedback at clericalheirs.org. Thanks for listening to Clerical Heirs. See you next time.